Hello, my name is Svavar Benediktsson and today I will be discussing my autobiography and how I wrote it. In this essay I will explain what methodology I used to write down my own autobiography about the years I spent living in Norway. I will go over the reasons for choosing those years as a basis of my autobiography, the sources I have used, the role of memory in microhistorical research with regards to this text. Additionally, I will explore the reliability of my own memories and their usage when writing the text and assessing the value of memory as a source for history in general. The task bestowed upon me at the beginning of the semester was to write my own autobiography. The parameters were set wide. I could write about anything that had happened to me personally during my 20-year-long life. Therefore, when I first sat down and began to think about how to proceed, I was in a sense stumped. In the beginning, I thought about writing about my entire life. However, given the page limit, 10 pages, it proved difficult to be concise enough for it to fit on the aforementioned 10 pages. I therefore decided to narrow it down to a smaller period in my life, namely the eight years I spent living in a foreign country. As the viewer may know, I was born in Iceland in the year 1998. During my first 11 years on this planet, I lived in a town called Hapnarfjörður. About after the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009, my parents had grown tired of the endless economic fluctuations which have plagued Iceland since time immemorial. They thus deemed it necessary to move to Norway, where the economy tends to be more stable. I therefore spent the most f of my formative years in Norway, from the sixth grade up until my high school graduation in the spring of 2017. After deciding on what time period to focus on, I had to narrow the focus even further, since a lot had happened during those eight years. Therefore, I had to decide to write about what to write about specifically, which of course is a question all autobiographers must ponder, which memories to embrace and which ones to reject. For, the, for me, the most important question to answer was, how personal did I want to get in my own autobiography? Would it be an endless series of emotional accounts about my feelings regarding past events, or should it rather be a chronological tale of my own life? After weighing the options in my head, I decided to have a mixture of the two forms, which in practice meant that the autobiography became a chronological tale, which describes a sequence of events. However, it also discusses how those events affected me personally. Of course, there are certain limits to this approach, since I would never be able to wholly gauge what I was feeling at the time without having contemporary resources. Instead, the memories themselves and the feelings and emotions associated with them are not contemporary to those events which the memories seek to recreate. Rather, the emotions which I remember feeling are constructed after the fact. It would therefore be spurious to claim that the emotion expressed now regarding events that happened in the past are the same as those which I expressed when the actual event took place. For example, when writing about my first years in Norway, I write that I felt a general sense of loneliness of moving away from my home country and leaving my friends. However, can I assert this to be a certain fact? Probably not. Instead, I am assuming that I felt lonely at the time, since those are the feelings and mem my memories associate with that time period. My memory was the main source for the autobiography, which makes one ponder on the trustworthiness of the account I am giving. As the historian Seudur Gilvi Magnusson points out, when one writes an autobiography, there will always be some form of censorship. He distinguishes between two types of self-censorship, conscious censorship in which the autobiographer consciously chooses which memories are accepted and thus get written and which ones are rejected, and subconscious censorship in which the author is not aware of the censorship and simply forgets unpleasant memories and chooses subconsciously not to write them about them. Since I was already aware of this phenomenon, I doubt that I have subconsciously chosen to censor certain events in my life or in my narrative rather, I have, however, consciously censored certain events, since my friends presumably would like those events to remain private. While there appears to be a consensus among many historians that memory is too unreliable and thus autobiographies as well, other historians, such as the aforementioned Sigurd Gilvi Magnusson, reject this view to some extent. He argues that one should not completely reject an autobiography 
biographer's narrative. He says that even though individuals certainly change over time, a certain core of emotions attached to important events remain static. Therefore, in general, these emotions expressed by the writer in connection to those events are, in a certain sense, the same emotions that the author experienced in the past. This argument is very topical for my autobiography due to the lack of eco-documents which made me rely, on my, uh, rely almost exclusively on my memory as my main source. Of course, one's ability to remember past events in which one participates varies from person to person. When I first began writing my autobiography, I realized that my memory was lapsing about certain things. Subsequently, I decided to test my own memory to see if it could be considered reliable. I sat down with a pen and paper and decided to write down the names of my classmates from different stages of my life. When I was creating the list of my classmates from the 7th grade, for example, I was only able to fully remember about 30 names out of 50. When I was trying to recall the names of my middle school classmates, I was only able to remember 35 names out of 45. While the names of my classmates in the first grade of, first grade of high school, I remembered only 18 out of 31. And during my junior and senior years, when I attended a different school, there I was able to recall all the names of my classmates, namely 29 out of 29 names. Although this little mind exercise is not very scientific, and in the subsequent days I was able to recall more names, this little experiment nevertheless demonstrates how faulty one's own memory can be. It showcases that one cannot reliably rely on one's own memory exclusively when writing an autobiography. Rather, one should preferably seek out other sources such as written accounts, photographs, or other contemporary sources which can either corroborate or refute one's own recollections. However, when I first began looking into my own life, I stumbled upon a certain conundrum. Where would I find sources about my life besides my own memory? The answer proved to be complicated. I have never kept a diary of any sorts, and therefore I could not rely extensively on my own contemporary first-hand accounts of events. Neither did my friends whom I consulted with. Therefore, the only written sources I could find th uh, that were written in the time period were hundreds of thousands of Facebook messages between me and my friends. However, I decided against using them as a major source for the autobiography, the main reason for this being time constraints. It would take an incalculable amount of time to read through hundreds of thousands of Facebook messages. Additionally, they often lack clear contexts and are often spread out between different group chats and different people, and it would therefore be extremely time-consuming to read through them and try to put them in context for a simple 10-page essay. Indeed, using Facebook messages or other forms of digital communication as a source has a certain limits. It is quite possible that these forms of text, as you, and using these texts as corroborating source, does more harm than good. These messages might have a detrimental effect on how one remembers certain events and may end up causing more confusion and not answer the questions one sought to answer. Nevertheless, Facebook messages proved to be valuable when uh, used to corroborate certain dates and sequences of events. I used the search tab in Messenger to look for some keywords which might be connected to events and when they took place, in addition to asking my friends about how, where, when and why certain events took place. When I had finished writing my autobiography, the first draft of my autobiography, I decided to have my father read over the draft. This served a dual purpose. Firstly, he would be able to correct any grammatical mistakes made in the text, but more importantly for him, to spot any factual errors. Since we often were participants in the same events, which I describe in the autobiography, it made sense to have someone who was also present to read the text and give his perspective on the course of events. This could not be, could not be done to the same extent with the parts of the text which deal exclusively with events which he did not participate in, for example, my experiences at school, with my friends, and etc. In addition to having my father read over the text, I asked my friends about specific points. They were, of course, unable to read over the entire narrative since they are Norwegian while the autobiography is written in Icelandic. This, of course, was better than simply letting the narrative stay as it was. For example, when I was writing about how we as a group became friends, I had remembered the events differently than my friends had. Thus, there were several different narratives of how we had actually become friends. The accounts, while similar in nature, were contradictory as to who did what and who spoke to whom, etc. 
When I was faced with this conundrum, I decided to synthesize the different narratives into a single narrative rather than simply using one narrative. Historians who have dealt with memory and its use as a historical source often tend to dismiss individual narratives as too subjective to be taken seriously. Instead, they try to connect these accounts into a larger shared narrative, in which many different memories are made into a collective memory or historical memory. These terms are only relevant to this discussion insofar as they can be connected to the discussion about the reliability of my own memory. When I was writing the text, I had to some extent rely on the collective memory of my friends with whom I had consulted when I was preparing to write the autobiography. How we became friends will probably never be fully known. Our supposed collective memory was not truly collective, in the sense that it was exactly the same. It was rather a compromise between all, our different, all of our different memories, as demonstrated by how we individually had remembered the events differently. When all is said and done, there are some questions which arise about the reliability of my narrative, since I have mainly relied on my own memory and the shared memory of my friends as the main source of information when writing my autobiography. The narrative is, of course, colored by my own subjective thinking and reminiscing and cannot, con be, cannot be considered 100% reliable, even with the additional sources of photographs, my parents and my friends. The account can never be truly considered completely objective.